I have been given the task of, uh, the theme is Fools for Christ, um, but uh, the subtitle that I was given uh, is When I Am Weak. Christian's approach to pain and suffering and trials and that mindset that a Christian has in the midst of difficulties is so very different from how the world views trials and difficulties, and it makes us look like fools in the eyes of the world. And so my passage is uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. I'll be focusing uh, more on verses 7 through 10, uh, but let's pick it up uh, at the very first verse, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. This is God's infallible and inerrant word. I must go on boasting, though there is nothing to be gained by it, I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise. It's the same word as in today you will be with me in paradise. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told which man may not utter. On behalf of this man, I will boast. But on my own behalf, I will not boast except of my weaknesses. Though if I should wish to boast, I would not be a fool, for I would be speaking the truth, but I refrain from it, so that no one may think more of me than he sees in me or hears from me. So to keep me from becoming conceited, because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from being, becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weaknesses. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Now, yesterday, actually it was the day before, I received a, a phone call from a member of the congregation. An enormous, heavy burden had befallen this member, a trial that is unimaginably awful. And uh, it was a reminder, once again, uh, that it is through many tribulations that we enter the kingdom of God. That was Paul's uh, first lesson that he learned after his first missionary uh, journey, and he's reporting back to uh, the church base in Antioch, and as he sets out uh, and plans for his second missionary journey, that was the lesson that he had learned. It is through many tribulations that we enter the kingdom of God. The tribulation here is called a thorn in the flesh. Many of you have been gardening, doing yard work, and you've gotten a, a thorn, and it's buried deep into your fingers, and it 
It can be painful. It can be annoying. And if you don't remove it, it can become worse, can become infected and cause all kinds of damage. This is a metaphor, a thorn in the flesh. We don't know what it was. Some have conjectured that it was a problem with his eyes, that he had bad eyesight in days before prescription glasses. He writes to the Galatians and he says, see in what large letters I write to you, and whether that is meant to be taken metaphorically or literally, we don't know. He tells us in verse 10 that they consist, this thorn in the flesh consists of weaknesses and insults and hardships and persecutions and calamities. All kinds of trials and all kinds of tribulations. Various kinds of trials Peter talks about in First Peter. Multi-variegated, a spectrum of trials. John Calvin, in his wonderful commentary on First Peter, wrote those memorable lines, it is, God has so ordained the church from the very beginning that death is the way to life and the cross the way to victory. Death is the way to life and the cross the way to victory. Nor is Paul sure of the source of this trial, this thorn in the flesh. From one point of view, it is a messenger of Satan. So as he's reflecting on what we might call, using a $10 word, causality. What is the cause of trial? What is the cause of pain? What is the cause of evil? And there are various approaches to answering that question. From one point of view, Satan did it. We see that in the book of Job when there was a day when God met with his angelic beings, and Satan also was among them. Lots of unanswerable questions, but it certainly reminds us that Satan too is accountable to God. Satan did it. It is a messenger of Satan. He prowls about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. We are to live our lives conscious of his existence and conscious of his hatred of all that is God's. But from another point of view, he says, it was given to me. It was given to me. A thorn was given me in the flesh. Given to him by whom? Given to him by God. Satan did it, yes, but in a different sense, it was sent by God. It was ordained by God. Without God being the cause of evil, the author of evil. So on a different level of causality, and those of us who are Reformed and, and Calvinistic, we want to stress the absolute total sovereignty of God over all things. Not just good things, but evil things, wicked things, satanic things. He is still in control. God sent it. God ordained it. Satan did it. It was a messenger of Satan, but at the very same time, and in a different perspective, it was God's doing. He ordered it. He decreed it. God moves in mysterious ways His wonders to perform. He plants His footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm deep in unfathomable minds of never-failing skill. He treasures up His bright designs and works His sovereign will. Now, before we look at verses 7 through 10, we need to at least say something about the opening section of chapter 12, and uh, Paul talks 
in the third person, he is conscious that he has seen things and heard things that he is not allowed to utter and he's not allowed to speak about and he can't even write about them. He's seen glory. He has seen things that you and I have never seen. He was caught up to the third heaven. He's not sure whether this was a vision or whether he was literally taken in the body to this third heaven. He's been privy to things that could cause him to become boastful and prideful. Theology can do that. Reformed theology can do that. You know more, you've read more, you've seen more, and it can become a prideful thing. And so, he says, lest he be puffed up with pride. Paul is recognizing perhaps a besetting sin, one of his besetting sins. God sends a thorn in the flesh to prick that balloon of pride that lets you know in advance that that is one of many reasons why we are led into trials and tribulations. It is to keep us humble. It is to keep us from pride. It is to keep us from arrogance. It is to keep us from making too much of ourselves, to remind ourselves that apart from God we are nothing, and apart from God we can do nothing. Now let's look at this section, verses 7 through 10. And I want to see a number of things, point out a number of things that emerge from this passage. And the first is that suffering may be difficult to accept. Suffering may be difficult to accept. We are under great pressure, far beyond my ability to endure. He says we, we despaired of life. That's Paul writing elsewhere in 2 Corinthians that, that he, endured, he endured such hostility and he endured so much trial that he despaired even of life. Think of Job reduced to skin and bones, almost at death's door by the time we reach the end of the book. Think of Jonah in the belly of that great fish. Think of Haman in Psalm 88, the final verse of that psalm, darkness is my only friend. That's pretty dark. If that's where you are, I'm glad it's there. It's like a safety valve. I don't live in Psalm 88 from day to day, but there may be a day when Psalm 88 will be my best friend and I will know that someone else has been in this dark place. Now, Paul tells us here that he wished this thorn in the flesh to be taken away. And he prayed on three occasions. We'll talk about it in, in a few minutes. But his initial response to trial, his initial response to a thorn in the flesh was not acceptance, at least on one level. There, there are iterations of godliness and iterations of maturity that suggest that the mark of spiritual maturity and the mark of spiritual piety is that on the onset of trials, you immediately acquiesce to it. That you are un, that you are unfazed by it. And it is a mark of your godliness and it's a mark of your piety that when trials come, you immediately say, these are from the Lord, I must accept them, I must, I must take them for what they are and say nothing about it. Of 
But that wasn't Paul. That was not Paul's reaction to the thorn in the flesh. He wanted life. He wanted to hear the birds singing. He wanted to feel the cold wind upon his face. He wanted to be around his friends. The assurance that God loved him and that he had usefulness in the kingdom of God, that he was safe in the arms of Jesus. But instead, he's given this thorn in the flesh that unsettles him. Paul wasn't about to lie down and pretend this wasn't a problem. And I'm saying that there are versions of spirituality and they have existed in the Reformed community as well as elsewhere that suggest that the mark of godliness is submission. Three times, he says. Now, I don't know fully what that means. My guess is that he's talking about three seasons of prayer where he committed himself with the resolve and focus to ask God to take this away. Now, do you question the maturity of the Apostle Paul? You do so at great risk, but you do so at the risk of questioning the piety and the holiness and the godliness of Christ Himself in the Garden of Gethsemane. That prayer that He uttered when, when in His human consciousness He is aware of what it means to be a Savior, what it means to redeem His people, the sheer cost of it as it bore down upon Him. Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Let it pass. And you need to stop there. I, I know it goes on to say, not my will, but, but yours be done. But you need, to, you need to pause for a second. What is, what is Jesus asking of His heavenly Father? He's asking that this burden to which He has committed Himself and to which the Father has sent Him to accomplish that it be taken away. He's saying, Father, this is, this is too much. Can you not find within yourself a way of, of taking it away, of removing it? What if the Father had said yes? What if the Father had said, it is too much, my son. These people are not worth it. Come home and let us enjoy glory together. What if, what if the Father had answered that prayer? There was no voice like at the baptism or the transfiguration that said, you are my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. There was, there was just the silence. And what I'm saying is that Paul and, and Jesus, their immediate response to trial is not acquiescence. It is to run to their heavenly Father and to ask God if it is possible within the bounds of His decree, within the enormity of His compassion and love, within the unlimited nature of His sovereignty, to take it away. You remember what Paul says elsewhere, that I have learned in whatsoever uh, circumstance I'm in therein to be content. But you need to see the emphasis on the word learned. It wasn't an instinct. It didn't come immediately. He learned it. He learned it through the process of prayer. He learned it through the process of asking God and learning that this was not God's way for him. Paul wasn't a man to acquiesce by nature. I don't think that was his personality. I think Paul was irascible. I think Paul was difficult. 
That may be a lesson that causes you a great deal of needless anguish, that somebody comes to you and says, you know, you shouldn't be struggling with this trial. You should be singing, I'm H-A-P-P-Y. You need to learn contentment. You know these people, heartless and thoughtless. It's okay to say, I want it to go away. Father, if it be possible, let this cup, let this trial be taken away. Well, secondly, another lesson I think from this passage is that praying may have to stop. Praying may have to stop. There were two factors, I think, that might have encouraged the Apostle Paul to believe that his prayers were going to be answered in the way that he desired. What were those two things? One was the earnestness with which he prayed. He prayed with earnestness. He prayed with conviction. He prayed with resolve. These were not half-hearted prayers. He prayed with the whole of his humanity. You remember the parable in Luke 18 of the unjust judge who because of the earnestness of the pleas, even at midnight, he rose up in order to placate. Paul was praying with importunity. That's a great word, isn't it? Importunity with courage, with conviction, with resolve. There's that sentence, I think it comes from Cyril of Alexandria, that we should pray in such a manner as to make God ashamed if He does not grant us our request. That's bold. To pray, to pray in such a manner that we make God ashamed if He doesn't answer us according to our conviction. Imagine the power of the prayers of the Apostle Paul. And as his heavenly Father looks down upon him, his most useful servant in the kingdom of God at this period in redemptive history. I think a second, a second factor that would have led the Apostle Paul to believe that God would answer his prayers in the way that he desired was the compassion of God. Not only the earnestness of his praying, but the compassion of God. The compassion of his heavenly Father. The intercessory prayers of our great high priest sitting upon the throne, ever living to intercede for us who is touched with the feeling of our infirmities. Father, look at your servant for whom I gave my life in atonement. I too know what these trials are. I too have experienced this thorn in the flesh. Relieve him if it pleases you. And the power, the extraordinary power and effectiveness of the prayers of the incarnate Savior, our great high priest. God longs to relieve us of our trials, even though He has decreed them. Now there's a Calvinistic thought. God longs to relieve you of your trials even though He has decreed them. And instead, Paul is told, my grace is sufficient for you. My grace is sufficient for you. It's an interesting use of the word grace, isn't it? We tend to think of grace as that which we experience when we first come to Christ. We think of grace as God's unmerited favor toward us in forgiving us of our sins through the substitutionary death, the propitiatory death of Christ on our behalf. We tend to think of grace as that which 
renders us acceptable to God, that we are children of God, that we are justified by faith alone in Christ alone. But what does that grace do to us when you know that you are justified? when you know that you are as righteous as Christ is righteous in, in God's federal dec- declaration of our justification, that we are the children of God, and if children heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ, what does it mean to be a child of God that nothing can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord? That strengthens you. That makes you bold. That makes you strong. My grace will be sufficient for you. The knowledge of who you are, the knowledge of your identity in Christ, the knowledge that nothing, not life, nor death, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor anything in all of God's creation, you are more than conquerors through Christ. And it strengthens you makes you bold, makes you courageous. It'll help you lift up your head in the midst of darkness. God comes and He says to Paul, remember who you are. You're the child of a king. You're the child of a king with Jesus, your Savior. You're the child of a king. Paul is brought, do you see, through reflecting on God's providence and supernatural persuasion of the Holy Spirit that he must live with this affliction, that it is not going to be taken away, that the praying for it to be taken away needs to stop. Now, I I don't know how to apply that in every individual circumstance of life. You know, if you lose a leg, it's probably time to stop praying that God would restore it. I think that's a providential sign that this is something that you have to live with. And I think each circumstance needs to be reflected individually and circumstantially. God will come to you and He will say to you, you must bear it, my child. And now you must bear it with courage, and you must bear it with patience, and you must bear it in the conviction that I will never leave you nor forsake you. It's a delicate balance, isn't it? We can give up praying too soon. Some of you have loved ones, siblings, children, parents who are not converted. You. You dare not stop praying for them. No matter what the providence, no matter what the circumstance, you dare not stop. You dare not rationalize that because God hasn't answered these last 20, 30, 40 years that He's never going to answer in the way that you desire. I would tell a parent praying for a prodigal son or daughter, never give up until your dying breath, never give up. But there are other circumstances in which providence will dictate. It's time to stop praying and time to start acquiescing. There's another lesson here. Providence is always purposeful. Providence is always purposeful. It was given to me, Paul says. It's the language of providence. This is something that God orchestrated. This is something that God decreed. This is something that God brought about as He fulfills what Paul says, that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. Everything, good things and bad things. Yes, Satan is doing it. It is a messenger of Satan. But nothing happens without God willing it to happen. Without God willing it to happen in the way that it happens. 
without God willing it to happen before it happens. It's the doctrine of sovereignty. It's a beautiful doctrine. It's a comforting doctrine. In the midst of a storm, God is in control. In the midst of a trial, God has His hand upon the tiller. A doctrine that is perfectly compatible with free agency. We're not robots. We make decisions. We have a will, and we are responsible for our actions, and yet God is in control. God is sovereign. He ensures that events, even evil events, even acts of Satan, they're not seen and not to be viewed as mere events. There's nothing irrational. We live in a world where everything is part of God's decree. There is a hand that guides, and there is a hand that directs, and there is a hand that overrules. There is a purpose, even if we don't understand that purpose. That's the entire lesson, I think, of the book of Job. All those hundreds of questions beginning with why, and why me, and why now, and why so much? Did God answer those questions? No, He did not. In those final chapters of the book of Job, when it reaches his peroration, and, 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 and God says, who is this that darkens counsel with words without knowledge? Well, it was Job. And he sets up a, a quiz. And you're expecting Job to be asking the questions and God to be providing the answers, because that's the premise on which the book of Job is initially written. But God turns the tables, and He says, no, I will ask the questions, and you will answer me. And you remember the questions. Where were you at the foundation of the world? What sort of question is that? Who asks questions like that? And there are 60 questions, 70 questions about tunnels underground and, 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 and the the stars in the night sky, and all kinds of questions, and Job can't even answer one of them. And he must lay his hand upon his mouth. It's not important that you understand. What is important is that God understands. You cannot enter into the mind of God. You cannot fathom the, the eternal purposes of Almighty God. You're just a speck in the universe. But He has you in the palms of His hands. It's not important that you have an answer to all of your questions about these thorns in the flesh. What's important is that you trust Him that you lay your hand upon your mouth and stop talking back to Him. And you can only do that when there is a profound belief in the providence of God, that there is a reason, that the universe is not irrational, that history and your life is not irrational. In the midst of pain and in the midst of trial and in the midst of difficulty, we must believe, we must believe Romans 8, 28, that all things work together for the good of those that love Him. What is there outside of that, if that is not your worldview? There's only chaos and confusion and irrationality and black holes and uncertainty. But that is not our faith. Our faith is that God has this. Yes, even this trial, even this difficulty, even this horrendous trial that makes you despair of life. Blind unbelief is sure to err and scan His work in vain. 
God is his own interpreter, and he will make it plain. There's a wonderful verse in Lamentations 3.33, and I prefer the King James translation. God does not afflict willingly. Now, there's another Calvinistic turn of phrase. God does not afflict willingly. There is something in the heart of God that would keep you from all pain, but it's not part of His decree. In Paul's case, he suspected that it had something to do with his propensity to be prideful because of what he had seen and what he had heard that he's not allowed to speak of. His great abilities, his privileges, this this experience, whether in the body or out of the body, in the third heaven. And God has to do to the Apostle Paul what he had to do to wily, conniving Jacob. He must break his hip socket and cause him to limp. Every day thereafter, as he walked with a limp, and perhaps arthritis set in, and that limp got even more pronounced, it would be a reminder that he must trust God and not his craftiness. He's learning, Paul is learning, do you see, that God wants him to grow in grace. Difficult as that is to contemplate that the means, the trajectory by which we grow in grace involves learning to live with pain and suffering and trial in a godly way, in a trustful way. Now, there is such a thing as innocent suffering. It's the book of Job. Job's suffering was not due to any sin that he had committed in the past. He was the godliest man on the face of the earth. God says that. That man born blind in John chapter 9 and the disciples ask, who sinned? Was it him or was it his parents? And Jesus said, neither. But his trial was in order that a great miracle might be done that would be a great cause and source of encouragement to believers who read about it, even you and me. Sometimes it's not because of past sin, but of possible and potential future sin. Pride, in Paul's case, to keep me from exalting myself. Why does this occur to someone as godly and useful as Paul? We, we can understand it of others, but why the Apostle Paul? Omnipotence is never capricious. Paul came to see it as a death sentence because of the innate tendency to rely on oneself. He was, he was God's foremost apostle. He had taken the place of Peter, and the temptation was self-reliance and pride. He must rely on God. He must lean on Him. He must be directed by Him, led by Him, strengthened by Him, taught by Him. And I think God gave him a trial that was severe because he was the most useful in the kingdom of God. If providence is gentler, if the world is more tolerant, if Satan less hostile, is it because we are being withdrawn from the front line of Christian usefulness? That's a question, isn't it? That if we don't have trials and difficulties, maybe God is withdrawing us from the front line of usefulness. 
You notice in this passage, there's something else I want us to see br very briefly, that we are to boast in our infirmities. It's counterintuitive, isn't it? You boast in your abilities, you boast in your gifts, you boast in your status. But Paul says, I boast in my infirmities. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. When I am weak, then am I strong. He says elsewhere, I take pleasure in infirmities. We glory in tribulation. Why? Because suffering produces perseverance, and perseverance produces character, and character produces hope. Confidence, assurance. Suffering can do many things. Of the three crosses on Calvary, trial hardened one of them. In another, the trial was redemptive and substitutionary. And in the other, it humbled him, causing him to cry, remember me when you come into your kingdom. The secret of walking comfortably with God is to understand that our light and momentary affliction are achieving for us an eternal weight of glory that far outweighs them all. Am I looking to the thorn in the light of my pain, or am I looking to the thorn in the light of glory to come. And that's the fool in the eyes of the world, to glory in my tribulation. You can only do that if Christ is your treasure, if Christ is your treasure. And then you will see that suffering and trial and difficulty will bring you closer to Him to walk with Him day by day until He finally brings you home to Himself. Father, we thank You for Your Word, and we ask for grace, grace to hide it within our hearts. For those here facing a very particular thorn in the flesh, and it has a name. It may be cancer. It may be the loss of a loved one. It may be irreparable damage in the place of employment and a thousand other things. And we pray, grant them grace now, the power of grace that will be sufficient for them day by day until you bring them home to glory. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.